Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are on this planet, and welcome to our City Live. So this is a very special City Live because it's recorded, first of all, though it's not live, but it's recorded because we are at the AGU, the American Geophysical Union meeting here in New Orleans. And uh, for this City Live, I decided to invite um, a very special guest, Rachel Harris. Hi, Rachel. Hello. So Rachel uh, is a microbiologist at Harvard University. And uh, the reason we, I invited you, Rachel, is because you are a convener of a session on Tuesday morning about Mars that I really like. And I'm gonna read the title of this session because it was entitled, The New Mars Under Underground, Astrobiology and Space Resources at the Dawn of Mars Sample Return. So you caught my attention with the title, but you also caught my attention because at the beginning of the session, you show a slide where we could see some human exploration of Mars. Mm -hmm. So I think this is kind of a motivation of this session. So tell us a bit, uh, what's, why, why did you organize this session here at the AJU this year? So the New Mars Underground has been a session that has been in existence for a few years now. Um, and it was started by uh, Vlado Stamenkovic, who was formerly at JPL, who's now since moved on. And he's kind of passed the torch on to myself and Jesse Tarnas, who is now at JPL, as well as Ina Plaza, who is at the German Aerospace Center. And the whole focus of the new Mars Underground um, is actually kind of a reincarnation of the original Mars Underground team founded by Penny Boston and colleagues in the late 80s and early 90s. And this was a group of scientists whose interest in exploring Mars included looking at the subsurface. Mm -hmm. So including um, caves and lava tubes and, and eventually drilling deeper as well, um, with the notion that there was a lot that we do not know about the Martian subsurface, but a lot of information could be there to help us better understand not only the geologic history of the planet, but also its habitable potential. And so in the last couple of years, Jesse, Ina, and I have taken on the reins as co-conveners for the new Mars Underground, uh, really trying to focus the session on not only bringing in obvious uh, cont contributions such as uh, the new data from the InSight mission, mm -hmm. which is obviously probing the subsurface, but also um, other work that should be highlighted. So for example, the Mars swim team uh, or the subsurface water ice mapping group, uh, looking to better understand the depths at which water ice is found across the planet. Also trying to understand communication uh, ge geochemically between the subsurface and surface, and as well as implications for habitability, not only for the potential for microbial life, but also thinking about um, the eventual um, missions where we want to send humans to oh, Mars. Nice. It's a very diverse session. It's a very broad topic, but it's. Um, I, I like the fact that you're focusing on the subsurface, of course, because maybe you could explain our speak, our, our viewers here. Um, we have been sending missions on Mars for years, right? Yes. But most mission was orbiting Mars, and some have, was rowing on the surface of Mars. But more recently, we're interesting more into the depth, the the interior of Mars. Can yes. you give us some idea, some some uh, example of missions? I mean, I think honestly, our our earliest inferences of the something interesting going on in the Martian subsurface lean back. I would say, you know, if not the Mars Exploration Rover's Spirit and Opportunity, uh, you know, Spirit discovering, for example, the home plate, mm -hmm. uh, potential hydrothermal site. Um, and so evidence of there clearly being deep groundwater interactions happening over long spatial timescales, but also following up with the Phoenix mission uh, in the you know, mid 2000s, the discovery of just you know, scooping just barely a little bit of regolith from the surface and you're finding these uh, water ices and perchlorate brines um, just right beneath the subsurface. And so that was really kind of a motivation of seeing there's clearly, it's not clearly uh, not a dead planet, and there are clearly complex processes mm -hmm. going on just beneath our rover's wheels and our lander's feet. So, um, you know, I think in recent years, especially with uh, Insight and Perseverance, and now, you know, fingers crossed with uh, the ExoMars, Rosalind Franklin rover, we're really wanting to dive more deeply into the Martian subsurface and collect samples and learn more about the geochemistry of, of, of this region. Yeah, it's a fascinating 
uh, area of research, and I want to I want to discuss one big mystery with Elon Mars is the presence of methane. Oh, I love this question. <laughs> yes, <laughs> there was two two um, two speakers who basically mentioned uh, mm -hmm. this the mystery, but also some kind of new idea. So how we could solve this mystery? So yes. tell us first the mystery. And, uh, well, so I mean, methane is is quite an enigma on Mars, and I think uh, depending who you talk to, you might get into a fight with them <laughs> about <okay. laughs> about methane. Let's not fight. <laughs> uh, no, no. Um, I'm I'm a big fan personally uh, of the methane story on Mars. A lot of my research um, tries to consider a microbial. The potential for a microbial contribution, um, so therefore methane as a potential biosignature, mm -hmm. um, and we can talk about that in a little bit. But you know, in terms of you know our session, I guess to give a, a background for our viewers who may not understand the history of methane on Mars. So about twenty odd years ago, kind of our first ground-based telescopes observations of Mars suggested that there were. Um, part per billion levels of methane uh, plumes that were being observed in the Martian atmosphere, uh, in the Northern uh, atmosphere. And these uh, recordings have been kind of conspicuously on and off, absent or present ever since. Mm -hmm. And as we have finally been sending ground-based detection um, instrumentation onto the planet, uh, such as the Curiosity rover at Gale Crater and now Perseverance, and as well as the, the Mars, uh, ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter, looking for more definitive uh, detection of methane, uh, both in the atmosphere and locally outgassing from the ground. There's, there's still kind of been this very interesting disconnect where there seem to be periods of time where there might be small outgassings of methane somewhere across the surface, immediately dissipating and very, very low concentration. So, you know, on the order of a few parts per billion or maybe even a few tens of parts per billion. And so by comparison on earth, you know, we're, we're parts per million uh, of methane. So several orders of magnitude lower. And the, you know, conspicuous presence absence of methane aside, uh, I think, you know, coming from an astrobiological perspective, methane could be potentially the most conspicuous biosignature that is presently on Mars for us to identify whether or not life could be present now, extant, coming from the subsurface, or it is a relic of past life, um, microbial activity in the subsurface. And so scientists are very, very keen to not only determine, one, if the methane signals are real, uh, and two, what are the forces that are contributing to both the production and the consumption of methane? Because its residence time in the Martian atmosphere is actually orders of magnitude lower than what we would anticipate um, given normal abiotic sinks. Okay. So it's quite an enigma. Um, so part of the presentations that um, were contributed to our session um, were... Yeah. Among, Nathan Barba. Yeah, Nathan Barba. He was presenting kind of a low cost um, opportunity to learn, low cost mission opportunity to be able to send a series of detectors onto the Martian surface to be able to get more precise measurements, but on a global scale yeah. uh, around the world and see if we can better constrain not only the concentrations of methane, but also where they're being sourced from. Yeah, that was a very interesting. Uh... Uh, mission concept because it's they're basically dropping this thing yes and they expect the instrument to survive when it lands on the surface of mars there mm -hmm. is some tests and it seems to be working so it's a very low cost project because yes it's basically uh, sending on mars a bunch of instrument that will crash on the surface but survive and then we'll be used to um to analyze the atmosphere at different location yeah exactly That's, um, yeah that was a very um inspiring mission in fact and then there was another part of the conversation, which was about ice. Water yes, ice. yes. So why is it important to find water ice on Mars? Well, I mean, I guess the most conspicuous answer is that life as we know it needs water. Um, and so obviously a huge question is, where is water on Mars? Mm -hmm. And we know on the surface of Mars, um, pure water is not going to be stable in liquid form just because of the atmosphere 
you know, one one hundredth the pressure of that of Earth's. And so we don't reach that magical triple point on Mars as we, you know, do here on Earth. And so you have to go further down. You have to go down into the subsurface in order to be able to come across the possibility of liquid water. And a huge question is how deep is that water table? Yeah. And so we are able to use, um, you know, from, from the atmosphere, um, we're able to make our best estimates about the depth of ice because ice across the surface is going to have a unique, um, I think like magnetic sounding coming from the planet compared to a regular, uh, the regular Martian regolith. Okay. Yeah. So there was a map shown at this session, the mm -hmm. first time I saw this map, I would try to find the link of it from Nathaniel. Uh... Yeah, from Than Putzig. Yeah. yeah. It was interesting to see this uh, this map of the distribution of water underneath the surface in Mars yeah. based on the combination of multiple instruments, in fact. Yes. So yeah, that's uh, so that's the beginning of the exploration of Mars to, to be able to go there. Though. That's... Um, yeah, I mean, we, they're absolutely, in terms of thinking about human exploration of Mars and sending people to the Red Planet, there are a lot of logistical um, hurdles that we need to be able to address in order to be able to, you know, not only safely send people there, but also have them have access to local resources. Yeah. Because the reality is that, you know, they're going to be too far away for, you know, regular <laughs> resupply. So, um, and you know, given payload constraints of our rockets, we can only send them out with so much. So in situ resource generation is uh, immensely important. And so being able to understand what resources we can take advantage of on the Martian surface are going to be crucial to understanding how long we can be there. No. So uh, you personally, are you involved in this type of research as well? So I look at Mars through the lens of microbial habitability. Mm -hmm. So kind of, again, going back to methane, I would say that, you know, my bread and butter is really trying to understand if, you know, the methane that we observe on Mars could possibly be a potential biosignature from microbial life as we know it. Okay. So, you know, Mars during the Nowakian was much warmer. It was wetter, um, much more comparable to earth at the time so this was several billion years ago and you know around the Noachian Hesperian climatic transition which was around um, three and a half billion years ago you had this transition from the planet being relatively warm uh, compared to today and wetter having liquid water available on the surface to a much drier colder planet um, and having water on the surface being much more transiently available. And so therefore the habitability of the surface dropping significantly. And so the way that methane ties into this is that the organisms on earth that make methane, they're called methanogens. Mm -hmm. They are some of the most primitive organisms uh, in the tree of life. So their metabolisms are very, very simple. They can just use carbon dioxide, CO2 and hydrogen gas or H2 and use that to make methane. Uh, they're thought to have been some of the earliest uh, metabolisms in existence. So timing wise, uh, if you're thinking of a shared origin of life uh, between Earth and Mars, you would have had an overlap between the time that methanogenesis evolved on Earth and when Mars was still warm and wet. And so if methanogens had ever made it to Mars via Earth or yeah. vice versa, you could have had the potential for uh, microbial methanogenesis occurring. And so with kind of all of that in mind, and with the notion that on Earth, the vast majority of methane that makes it to our atmosphere, almost 80%, uh, is ultimately biological in origin. It's made by microbes. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of gets back to my comment about it being perhaps the most conspicuous biosignature uh, that is easily detectable on another planet because we know a lot about methane biochemistry. We can look at its isotopic composition and be able to elucidate whether or not it is biological or abiotic in mm -hmm. origin. Um, and so, and it's easily measurable. So where I, my work comes in is to grow organisms that make methane on earth 
expose them to Martian like conditions and not only understand whether or not if they can survive and make methane, but also at the molecular level, how are their genomes responding to this stress? Oh, okay. And so trying to understand, um, for example, their exposure to perchlorates, okay. uh, which are pervasive across the Martian surface, very highly oxidizing, uh, very chaotropic, which means that they are, uh, you know, they can easily degenerate proteins, Methanogens are obligate anaerobes. They do not like oxygen. Uh -huh. So perchlorates, you would think, are bad news for these guys. Um, but indeed, it seems in the studies that, uh, that are coming from my work, uh, and along with some collaborators, we're showing that methanogens can only make methane despite exposure to perchlorates, but they may actually even be reducing it, which also has interesting implications for thinking about how humans may be able to um, benefit from a, micro a potential microbial partnership uh, on Mars with regards to perchlorates. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank um, you. So what are you going to do? You're going to stay all the way until Friday to this conference? I am, yes. So I actually, I have a, a gra first year graduate student who is giving a talk tomorrow afternoon, uh, actually looking at the habitability of hydrothermal vents. So okay. Uh, more with relevance to ocean worlds, which is kind of my other split personality. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I'll be here for the rest of the conference. All right. Thank you very much, Rachel, for joining us. Thank you so much, Frank. We, uh, that was a city talk, a recorded one, a city live, sorry, a recorded one. Uh, we are going to take questions, write the question at the bottom on our YouTube page. And uh, if I cannot answer, I'm not a biologist, so I probably will not be able to answer to biological, biology related questions. I will ask Rachel to do it for us. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank thank you. you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.